one, ready on one, ready on two. Shooters on the line. Shooters set. Sport of Fast Draw only shoots wax bolts and full powder blanks. No live lead ammo is ever used. All techniques are for descriptive purposes only. Find a club or gunfighter near you for help. Fast Draw has an excellent safety record and would like to keep it that way. The Final Shot Saloon and its guests and the associations referred to herein accept no responsibility for irresponsible gun handling. Be safe. Hello everyone and welcome to Behind the Light Gunfighter Profiles. This is where I get a chance to talk to gunfighters from around the sport of fast draw. My guest on this episode is Mr. Dennis Robinson. He has been shooting the sport of fast draw since the live fire days up there in Canada. And he's also part of the Thunderbirds Fast Draw Club. And um, the question that I let off with is how did you get in the sport of fast draw? And let's start the interview. Okay, it was quite a, a unique because uh, I was a young guy, almost, you know, high school. Conned a, storky, a storeman, salesman out of a 22 Winchester rifle, and I put the barrel in one pant leg and the stock in the other and head up Burnaby Mountain. I had no real guardian. Uh, I didn't know how far a 22 rifle could go, and Burnaby Mountain's only a thousand feet high, and it's just over the river here, the lake here. But they have a canyon down below, and I heard some shooting at a gun club down there. So eventually a friend of mine and I went down there, and we were planning on shooting a 22 high standard I got. So we were sitting there, and we got our board, and we screwed it onto the table top, and we are getting ready to shoot. And this old guy came along, and we didn't know he'd been kicked out of the uh, pistol contest that that club had had that day he did something wrong so here he is asking my friend and i how do you where do you get those boards and i pointed at the shed just over there so we had gotten to know the place a bit and uh so he started shooting what was on ivor johnson i think it was a nine shot revolver 22 and it's double action and my buddy noticed this guy cocked it and pointed at his foot he never did uh, get that board that you rest your gun on. So my friend whispered to me, hey, Dennis, look. And I said, oh, my gosh, don't say anything, because if we startle him, he might pull the trigger. So we waited, and we waited. And he's making up his mind to shoot, but he pulls the trigger. And he shot himself in the calf, and the twenty two I found out from the nurse friend, went down and shattered his, uh, shattered his ankle bone. But he maintained he hadn't been shot. But my friend had noticed uh, orange, like, blood on his, when he lifted his pant leg a bit. They asked him to pull it up again, and sure enough, then he started shaking, and he collapsed. And we called these people over the other end of the range, and they were the people in charge of the club. So the president there, he asked... Uh, what was he doing? Was he fast drawing? And we're going like, uh, no, what, what's that? 
And he says, uh, well, these silly guys, they shoot faster on Tuesday night, and two of them have drawn too quick and shot themselves in the leg already. Because all they did was live ammo then. So I says, oh, I know he wasn't doing that, but when did these guys shoot? He said, Tuesday. My buddy and I were right there the next Tuesday, and I got swallowed up. That's what I wanted to do. Wow. Crazy or not, I always figured I was young and invincible, and uh wouldn't happen to me. And we're shooting something like 222 uh, live ammo a night, and I eventually got the 38 Ruger, uh, 357 Magnum, but I was drawing and firing 38. And it would have eventually been a matter of time when I got me. The president of the club was a guy named Reg Patterson, the president of the Fast Draw. He was the Fast Draw director, and he was having political problems with those same people that were uh, questioning us about the fellow that got shot. And uh, he had about, on the directors, there were about four supporters of this new Fast Draw, and four that were against, and the president and his wife and his her sister were all executive and part of the other four. Well, pretty soon one of the guys reading the the uh, guns magazines and that came up with a clock radio type timer and hooked it to a uh, a wax square, which was like about 14 inches square. And we shot, we pulled the heads off our 22s and our 38s, and we shot wax slugs from about two feet away from this target against this timer. So here I am in that sport, and uh, the winter they went to Thousand Parker Street in downtown Vancouver and shot indoors at Silhouette Targets. Reg had a stopwatch, and he would yell, shooter in the line, shooter set, draw. And when you drew, he'd hit the timer button on the stopwatch, and one second later he hit it again, and any shot that came after was penalized from the score on the silhouette target, which was one of those army targets with the guy coming toward you. But anyways, I got there one night, just too late. The police were all over the place, and the ambulance had left. Another guy had shot himself in the leg with a twenty two. So shortly after in about sixty two, it was the timing was good because I was going down to shoot in the uh the world championships, the nationals down in uh Vegas the last year they had it. The Colt sponsored and I took a bus. It took me 40 hours to get down there, and the president of the main gun club was chiding us. He said, you guys, Fast Draw isn't serious, and anybody that was trying to join that was new, he would try and put them off like he did us, calling a, calling the Fast Draw guys names and silly, and they didn't, uh, they weren't serious. And I told him, not serious. Here I am going to Vegas shooting in the big nationals, and this club got its name in Guns Magazine because they did that, and you guys are just shooting local, so who's serious? <laughs> so anyway, it ended up with uh, me befriending a guy named Al Bryan that was the head honcho at the time of the Valley Gunhawks in San Jose, and eventually I brought some more guys from our club down to the, uh, uh, I think it was the North. California championships that the Gunhawks put on, and uh, Al showed us how to make blanks that will break balloons at eight feet. So I brought the uh, composition back, and the gun clubs were all down on the T-Birds then because of the third guy getting shot, and he made the papers. So we had to quit. That was the deal. But we convinced them that Dennis came back with a Thing that we can shoot blanks and wax bullets. And the club eventually decided that would be okay, but no live ammo from the hip. So we were about 30 strong at the time, and the club eventually right then split in half because the other half, led by the guy that shot himself in the leg, the last guy, 
they said, this is sissy stuff, so they went to Richmond, another club in a nearby uh, part of the, the Vancouver, greater Vancouver Valley. So what happened was a year later, he shot himself in the leg again with a thirty eight special. That did it. They were put to stop. That was it for the live ammo fast draw around here. Back then, a Texas hospital had named the sport sick draw because there were so many guys in Texas hospitals with leg shots. <laughs> and they were calling them leg shot yo-yos. But at this point, all we had to do was still politically fight our main gun club clique, what was against us. And Reg, he just started to notice, and he was making Arbo Jawa holster copies. We all had one. I still got mine. Did you get that picture I sent you? Yes, sir. Okay, if you notice, there's a Arbo Jawa drop loop copy on my hip. And that's what we use. I think that's one's got a uh, the bullet deflector on it, too, for when I was shooting live. But anyway... What happened was Reg, he was a saddle maker, and he was a Canadian Army sergeant, and he basically started the club. I teamed up with what we call my bogus uncle, Bob Stitt. He was a electronics and electrician guy. So at that time, we decided we are going to shoot what we call drop targets. They had a ramp when I got there that was just a, a wooden ramp with a uh, gutter down it, and they drop a steel ball, and the steel ball would hit the, uh, the micro switch on the ramp, which would turn on the lights on a target which had a wooden frame, but it had a solenoid holding it up. And when that light came on on top of the target, you had one second before the solenoid would drop because the steel ball would run down to the bottom of the ramp, took about a second, and it would hit another micro switch, which worked the solenoid, which dropped the target. And the target had squares on it, like the outside square of the body was, it was like a uh, 14-inch wide target, like the standard silhouette, but it was paper. And we'd shoot wax and bullets at that. We'd learned how to push them out, like the Americans and the magazines uh, showing us all that. So we were good to go. We were having a lot of fun. But the main club still, uh, the big big exec still didn't want us. Reg was getting beaten, as he put up by the young guys. Said he was too old and he wanted out. He was only 38 years old. But anyway, he got out and that left who's going to be president of the fast draw. And they put it to a vote with me and another guy, and the main club wanted me because they figured that they could, like, push me around. So I got the boat, and when I got in there, still being a greenhorn, they uh, called me at any time of the day with some kind of misdemeanor blaming the fast draw guys. I remember one of the fast draw, one of those times, a Sunday night, they hauled me out, and we shot in Tuesdays. So I went down there to the club, and they're pointing these bullet holes that were, like, way high up. And you guys are shooting up there and putting holes in the, almost in the ceiling. We're going to have to stop, stop you. And I really didn't know what to think, but I was sure it wasn't our guys. But then one of the guys, one of the directors that was pro fast draw, he was a policeman, he said, just a minute. And he put a pencil in the bullet holes, and they led right back to the 20-yard range. And we shot at the 7-yard range, so that exonerated us. But other people would come up and say, uh, hey, Dennis, I want to join this club. And these guys are telling me that you guys are idiots, and they don't want you around, and that we shouldn't be joining you. What's going on? So that did it. Bob Stitt and I bought out the uh, timers, the old clock timers and whatever the they had from them, and we moved to Port Moody Gun Club. And we relished there until, oh, I don't know, the 1970s when the uh, government expropriated the place to build a hospital. But then we got to where it was uh, Thompson Mountain, and that didn't work out. That was in its infancy, and 
too hard in the cars to get there, so Bob and I went and approached Langley Rod and Gun Club in 1975, and we've been there ever since. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah, that's, we've, we've been fighting a lot of odds over the years. In 2008, the police tried to stop us from shooting outside simply because the gun club wasn't uh, licensed for uh, restricted weapons outside. They found that out by accident when an archer tried to uh, start up out there. And they had policemen that okays the ranges. I ended up having a three-way conversation with him and the president of the uh, of the uh, Langley Rod and Gun Club, the then president. So he was just listening in, and the policeman basically told me that uh, there's some things he didn't like. And then he says, I had no idea you guys have been doing this for 50 years. And I said, yeah, most people don't. <laughs> But anyway, uh, the other gun clubs were having a laugh at this because we knew we'd been shooting out there since 1975, and here it is 2008, and they're trying to stop us. So then the cop, being friendly enough, he said that, uh, okay, what's to stop live ammo from going over that shotgun berm and one of those farms way beyond, ending up there. And I said, the same thing that stops... Uh, the shotgunners from putting a uh, slug in the shotgun. And he stopped for a minute, and I says, we have uh, line judges making sure we only use uh, blanks and there's no live ammo on our uh, equipment. None at all. So that did that. He okayed it, and now if we're probably the only club in Canada that has a permit to actually shoot outdoors. Let's put it this way, we're the only club in Canada that needed such a permit. <laughs> anyway, that's the way it goes. Now, Some your, days. now your club has been around since... Uh, did you Winter say? of 58. Yeah, I joined in 59. The, the, what you would call fast draw back then was kind of a mixture of live ammunition, and uh, they called that quick draw. Okay. That eventually they were naming a quick draw to give it a different moniker to separate it because of the accidents and because of the fact that some of those quick draw guys thought the fast draw with wax and blanks was not what they wanted to do. It was sissy stuff, or they call them blank poppers or primer poppers. And, for and the... that was that was unfortunate. Instead of sticking together, they uh, have these individuals that are gun shooters that from time to time, try and, uh, you know, knock you off. We've had rumors back in the 80s saying that the Thunderbirds were no longer around. Nick just phoned today, and he told me heard, or he heard a rumor that this was to be the last Canadian fast draw championship. And I said, where'd you hear that? <laughs> Uh, I've been at all the meetings. There's no such rumor. Now, you host the Canadian Open Championships for the WFDA uh, Chairman Sanction Contest. Uh, the, the date of it is July 20th and 21st of this year. Um, how long have the Canadian Championships been going on? Well, we started in about, the first one was in New Westminster, about 68. And then we had another one in the mid-70s. Two other, and then the one at the PNE. That was a big one. And uh, Gil Garris Sr. won that one. The first one was won by Al Bryan, and my wife won the women's. And the next one was uh, won by Cal Elric. And the third one was won by uh, Gil Garris Sr. and Lucy Fair. And, oh, Pat Witcher, one from California, won the uh, second one, the women's. And finally, we quit doing that and opted for vice chairman shoots because it's hard to find a, a shoot around here. Like, this is, this is anti-gun country where I am. It's not like Alberta where we've got a bunch of uh, cowboys. The cowboys up here are up in Merritt, which is about four hours away. But, but what happens is uh, we opted to do the vice chairman stuff. And then that went on for quite a while, but 
Richard Benedictson and Linda, they took on the Canadian Championships, and they held that thing going for, I don't know, like 10 or 11 years, eh? And that was good, and then that fell apart. Uh, Richard and Linda no longer do it. And that particular year, I got a call from a guy that we'd done shows. Well, we met him at a party. We'd done shows in Alder Grove for him. And he says, how's the fast draw going? And I says, not good. I says, we just lost the Canadian Championships in Alberta. And he says, oh. He says, well, how much does it take to run one of those? And I winged it. I said, five grand. And he says, Dennis, I'm a promoter. I'll get you five grand. So he went, but he couldn't. He got us uh, three grand instead. And with entry fees, that's barely enough to do it. We don't get all, as you know, the... The Canadian Championships doesn't pull in as many shooters as all the other shoots, but that's okay as long as Thunderbirds got enough members and we get enough from outside the area. Is that because of the restrictions that Canada has on firearms? The border, yeah. and all the rumors are, are stuff about the border, you know. And no, everybody seems to love the shoot. As a matter of fact, it was televised last year. I don't know if you heard of that, but it's a TV uh, program called Get Stuffed. And they came out and they filmed mostly the fast draw. It was a half-hour show, and it's been running. It's even running all last week. It's on the Olin channel. And uh, one thing happened to me a week ago that had me in tears, almost. I was at my uh, son, grandson's lacrosse game, and a little 10-year-old girl saw me, and she came running over, and she grabbed me around the legs and hugged me and looked up and said, I saw you on TV. That's crazy. Man, I almost cried. <laughs> of all of the things that's ever happened to me, that's right up there with the top, you know? But uh, you get a lot of funny stuff happening to people will say you look like such and such guys and all that. But the main part is people seem to like it, a lot of people don't want to do it because in Canada, getting into the gun game, as you can guess, is quite extensive. You know, you gotta, you gotta take a course, you gotta pay for that, you gotta wait for your guns, et cetera, et cetera. Things have gotten a little better over the years, partly because of uh, our, our battles. And last night, uh, yesterday, our province had its provincial elections, and earlier than this, I usually invite the celebrities to the Canadian Championships. And I couldn't do that until I found out if some of these people were going to be reelected or who the new guys are. Well, luckily, two of the people that shoot with us, they're liberals, the shoot and the celebrity, they have got back in, and the city mayor is also in. He shoots with us. So one of, well, there's three mayors that shoot with us. So before I could invite anybody, which I, I guess I'm supposed to be doing right now, but I've got to, I have to wait until I find out how the elections turned out because half of our celebrities are, in some cases, pretty big time MPs, MLAs, and what have you, and local uh, newspaper people. I tried to get a top Canuck guy last week to take part in it, but he wasn't interested. But I'm looking for sports people. We've only had a couple over the last six years. Our Canadian Championships uh, that started up in Alder Grove has been going for six years. So wow. basically, we're doing pretty good. The, the way that the Fair Days people have told us is, you guys fit right in, and they've bent over backwards to try and help us. Well, that's great. They, uh, they, they have a lot of political things that they have to do to get these grants. They have a lot of, but, and I didn't know what I was getting into. I got advice from them. That was the, the way it went. And we had to work our way around it, and the idea behind it is to hang on in there and keep going. As far as that goes, that should go for every fast truck. Well, I know a lot of people aren't going to be doing this after they do, say, about 10 or 12 years, 
nobody can expect people to go longer than that, but you do have guys like maybe you and I, or they call diehards. <laughs> you know? yeah. We just don't stop. You know, all, all of your years being in the sport, do you have a, uh, a favorite place that a contest was held at? Well, it was not. Uh, it was not a chairman sanctioned shoot, but way back years ago, a, uh, fella, there was, there was a shooter named Leroy Comstock and his son, Mike Comstock. They shot with the rawhides and they had, they were connected with Sizzler Steakhouses or something like that. And they talked to a guy named Gurney Richardson, and Gurney Richardson was running the Olympia Light Fair, which is the capital of Washington. Olympia is the capital, state capital. So he wanted to know if there was anything that he could put on, any new event, because he had rock stars and all that. And he didn't have a whole lot of money, but Leroy said, well, there's a guy in... Uh, Portland, Oregon, named uh, Dick Hornbeck, and there's a guy in Canada named Dennis that I'll give you their names, and they got they do fast draw, and the guy says, oh, what's this fast draw? And he told him about it, and he says, I'd love to have that. So they sent a letter to Portland, Well, Portland sent a brochure. They were better equipped than the T-Birds at the time. They sent a brochure to him, but the brochure had the misleading idea that they couldn't uh, put on anything for less than 500 bucks. So he threw that aside. And I was going to a shoot in California, so Karen and I dropped in at Richardson Sizzler Steak place, and he gave us a real good dinner, <laughs> free gratis. But he looked at an album. I had particularly taken pictures of uh, the Comstocks that I had when I was down in you know, the Rawhides area, Lompoc. California. So anyways, I did that, and he was sold, but he said, I don't have a lot of money. And he says, I just want the top five Americans to shoot out with the top five Canadians. And I said, well, we're trying to bring the clubs together. The clubs, the only two clubs are Thunderbirds in Vancouver and the Portland Fast Draw guys. And they've already done a shoot in Seattle, and I said that uh, we could do it for 400 bucks. And he didn't have a, a sweat over that, but I said I'd give the money to the Portland guys, and then we'd charge entry fees, and if there's a profit, our group and the Portland guys would split it. It ended up we were splitting something like 30 bucks each at the end of the shoot. But Olympia Lake Fair didn't require backdrops then. The WFD hadn't gone that far. And we were shooting directly across the lake toward the, uh, the state capitol tower. And that thing went on for three years with us in Portland, and then Ray Thilke took it over, and it went for another, uh, oh, it went about 12 years, I think, and it was only a $100 prize first place shoot, and the trophies went back. They also had a trophy for the club that, you know, the guy in the team shoot had the most wins. What we did was the Thunderbirds always made sure that we had one woman on our team, and eventually the Portland guys followed up with that. But every year we had to shoot it out. At the end of the shoot, they'd take the top five guys in Canada and the top five people in Portland, and they'd shoot it out. And that last year, they ended up, there was like two Canadian clubs and five or six Washington and, and Oregon clubs. But then it got moved to Vernonia. Ray took it to Vernonia in Portland, around in Oregon. And that lasted for a long time, too, until Ray moved to uh, eastern Oregon, and that was that. He told everybody, if anybody wants to take it over and do it, well, we couldn't. It's too dang far away. But uh, it just didn't go after that. But that Olympia shoot was my favorite contest of them all. Wow. The crowds, the, the excitement, you name it. A lot of Thunderbirds, a lot of Portland guys. We just had a great time for years. Now you and last year, uh, Dave Livingston put on that Oklahoma shoot. And although it didn't have much in the way of spectators, to me, that was the best 
contest for me to, to visit in the last few years. Really? Because to me, I had a ball <laughs> in those rides and all that after the contest. We'll be right back after this break. Be sure to check out ThunderbirdFastRod.com and check out the brochure for the 2013 Canadian Fast Draw Championships. That's at ThunderbirdFastDraw.com. Now, in your time, you've seen the evolution from live ammo to wax. What other significant changes have you seen? As far as Fast Draw goes, um, big, big changes were made when digital timers came along and that meant records had to be shelved and it's sort of like starting over again, that kind of thing. And uh, I don't know, there's, I guess sometimes the politics of, of, of the things got in the way in a lot of cases. They almost lost thumb busters throughout the sport until Dick Plum came along and he basically dictated that they were going to do keep thumbing in and make a special... Uh, room for thumb busting, and that brought a lot of the thumbers back in the WFDA. And I was glad to see Dick do that. So it ended up with, uh, you know, you can be your own worst enemy. I remember seeing, I remember people saying, is either twist or get out. And uh, on the reverse, in our own area, some relatives of one of the guys that twisted tried to stop their, their son-in-law from twisting. They tried to make it a rule in the club that Thunderbirds couldn't twist. Oh, wow. And I says, we have to twist for the shows. I do the twisting for the shows. And that's why I train these guys. So when I spoke up, the rest shut up, and that was good. We have twisting. We have cowboy fast draw targets, although we call them Hollywood targets. But you can do what you want. You know, and that's the way it should be. Some people quit our club at one point because we let kids in there. And like one of them I talked to years later, he went into rifle shooting because the other fast draw club he was in folded. They got the bickering. So he basically said that, Dennis, I have my son and kids at home, and when I come out at night, I want to uh, be away from children, and you guys let children shoot with you, kids. And I said, well, <laughs> that's right. We're a family club. So... You know, you get these individuals that think these different ways, and basically as long as they stick together and don't spread rumors around or try and, you know, knock off another group, when you do that, you know the, the term in unity there is strength, yep. and you've heard divide and conquer, and that's what these anti-gunners try and do. And if you fall into that and do it to yourselves or the others, Sometimes we have the shotgunners in, in Langley that are actually uh, aggressive toward the pistol shooters and vice versa. So it's like uh, I'm glad there are only a few individuals that think that way, not a lot. And for me personally, I think it's better for the sport of FASTRA as a whole um, just to stick together. Uh, because FASTRA is a very, very public sport, and I do believe that it's better for everybody. You know, I ask this question to everybody who comes on who's been shooting for a while or even a new shooter, but um, what advice would you give to someone who's either looking to get into the sport or just started out in into the sport? Oh, yeah, new shooters, well, my, my thoughts would be that they come out and find a gun club somewhere. That naturally would be the best choice to make. But uh, if you can find your own timers and have a place to shoot, then you're kind of like winging it on your own or going by what you can find off the various gunfighter zones stuff, you know, on Greg Custodio's site and that. But what I'm getting at is we had, and I've seen this often, a uh, new, newbie will come out to the club, and everybody wants to help. And he'll get five or six different people trying to help him. And he might pick somebody that he likes their style. However, that somebody might only show up once a month. And he'll come out every week and wonder where his protege, his, his mentor went. So what happened is uh, 
I just tell them, you know what, you sit back, you watch, you pick a guy, and we'll tell you if he's going to be a regular or not. He'll tell you or we will. And I said, I would say that, watch out, because you get, all people want, everybody wants to help, and we all have our own idiosyncrasies on how to draw, how to stand, how to shoot, how high to hold the balloon, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, when they come at you from four or five different directions, we're not wired that way. Our mind will go blank, go zonk. And I've had people tell me that in the early days. So being aware of that, the way I try and play it is to make any newbie aware of that. After that, he can fence for himself, right? <laughs> but the idea behind it is you can tell people and hope that they will listen and hope that they will do it that way. But that's the way to do it. You've been in the sport since 1958, and that's quite a long time. What what has kept you coming back and competing and traveling and, and being part of the sport of fast draw? There's a couple of things. I remember basically being stubborn when the gun club president came at me and said that, uh, you know, what you're doing here is illegal. And I said, how is that? He said that because there's no provisions in the Canadian law for fast draw. And I just turned and said, well, then there's no provisions against it, so I'm going to keep doing it. And I said, and if you manage to get rid of us, Oh, well, there's always the states. Me and him weren't the best of friends after a while, if you can imagine. And that's kind of why I got out of there. But I did keep that in mind. And whenever I'm shooting in the U.S. Uh, or Alberta or whatever, like Karen says, if she hadn't met me, she'd never see any of those places. And although we spend most of the time more time at the actual fast draw event than we do actually visiting in the towns but we do a lot of that we've seen Custer's last stand etc cetera, etc cetera. but the idea behind it is uh, we travel we meet people that we never would have if if we'd have stayed around here and just shot around here most of the Thunderbirds do that they just shoot around here there's only a very few of us that uh, travel on the circuit or even travel at all. There's been a few of us that will say, well, i got to go to one big shoot, at least see what it's like, you know? Yeah. And that's great, too. That's support, too. We've had guys that didn't get along with other guys that say, I don't want to be on the show, Dennis, because that guy I can't handle his mouth, and he doesn't compete in contests, so we should get rid of him. And the other guy is saying the same thing in reverse. If I'm looking at it, well, one guy's given us 50% support, and the other guy's given us 50%. That's great. <laughs> you know? yeah. These haven't either of them given any support. Sure. So you kind of got to keep them married, and it's it's hard. Yet, you know, the individual personalities in there. They should come out just to shoot and have fun. Have fun shooting instead of getting involved in any of the side stuff that can exist. The drop targets were a lot of fun. They rotted away just like old plywood pallet in there, but when that stuff was around, it was a lot of fun. We just couldn't get the wherewithal to start building them again. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you sent me that picture of the Paladin target. Um, now, did you make that, or was that store-bought? I made it, but the electronic idea was supplied with uh, from uh, Bob Stitt. Uncle Bob, he's gone now, but that guy was a great help to me. He got a rifleman's rifle copy built and chrome-plated, and he had loaned it to the club and let us put on shows with it, and we used to shoot the rifle versus the handgun, you know? Sure. And you could work that rifle into the 30s, under the second bracket. But you know what? When my 50th birthday came along, Bob showed up with the others, and he handed me the rifle, and he says, Dennis, you guys have used this more than I have, so I'm giving it to you. Wow. And wow, I cried, man. Wow, he gave me uh, $50 for five and one blank ammo, <laughs> ammo too. That's pretty special. He used that 
And uh, Bob, he did the wiring for the Plywood Paladin, but I got the idea out of a, uh, there's a popular electronics magazine. I still have the copy, and it shows a picture of a robot with its eyes lighting up, and it's all wired. It's like a, a human body almost. Really elaborate. And uh, back then, Fast Draw was popular. It was everywhere. Magazines galore, right? And the magazines, I remember looking at this one magazine that came out. It wasn't Guns. It was Gun World and had a picture of a guy that was thumb-busting. And it said, is this the guy to beat? Well, that guy never showed up. <laughs> but here I am inspired by this article because, hey, I can do that. So I went down there to that Vegas shoot. The details of that, Greg Custodio has on his uh, website. It was fun, that Nationals Championship. I didn't do very well, but I had fun watching and meeting people. And, that's and that part really helped get me in the fast draw and keep me in the fast draw. It was the people. I've heard that more than once, that it's the people. And, you know, no matter what association you're you're a part of they they've always said that it's the people and the camaraderie and uh it really does have that family aspect to it yeah that's right my doctor just asked me why do you do this you're 75 and he saw that uh television thing and he says uh you're really good with people dennis but he says uh this age he says what kind of chance you got against the young guys so i told him I says, I finished in the top ten a heck of a lot. Finished second at Canadian last year, and as long as I can give the other shooters trouble, I'm going to hang on in there. I will say from experience, uh, you are one of the most accurate shooters in our sport. That's what they tell me, but I have my moments. I usually don't go for speed. I've twisted twice in competition, and one of them I did come in second, but I looked up my twisting times with the misses I had. My ram fanning, if I'd hit them all, would have done just the same kind of thing. You know, it's, it's sort of like what you what you feel comfortable with as a shooter. I can do a show, and I can twist, and I can probably hit every second one. I usually do. And if I hit the first one, fine. But the club is going to give me, who's ever on the timer, is going to give the audience, give me another try. And what we don't do is we don't have, we try not to anyway, we don't have a person up there doing any more than two tries because after the third try, all you're going to get is a sympathy clap. The audience is looking at it like, oh, yeah, if you leave him up there, sooner or later, he's going to hit, right? Right, right. So you don't want to do that. And I try and tell people, you know, if there's something you can't do ten times in practice, don't try it in the show. But that's me. That's the way I operate, not the way everybody else does. So, Do you have a favorite event? Uh, blanks, wax, open, um, elimination, anything like that? It used, it, it, yeah, wax bullet shooting I like the best. Not any particular one, uh, but I like doubles. Actually, I like multiple shooting of any kind. Like uh, Don Maury in California had that pop-up cowboy that had a balloon on his head and one in each arms, and the arms are waving and the hats going up and down with a balloon in it. Oh, yep, yep. Fantastic. That's great. Ray Thilke designed a nine-inch color balloons. You had a red, I'd say I'm winging it here, red, yellow, green, and it would slowly spin around in a circle, and you had two reaction times to go for the one balloon. Anything that's challenging or different, that's what I like. Very cool. And they did that down in Olympia as, uh, as a, uh, you know, a side, side shoot. We had a lot of fun with it. It's just like something new, something different. After a while, after all these years of shooting standing blanks, I got to say, that's the one that I am most tired of. The standing blanks. Really, for me, but that's me. How long have I been doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in shows, that's always you. <laughs> and doubles is great, but, you know, I also do that balloon trick, uh, balloon stuff, 
where I put up five balloons and go around in a circle knocking them all out. Usually Karen's the target, or at least she's holding the target. And it's been on TV a few times around here. Nationally, actually, that was on once on the George Strombopoulos show across Canada. But, uh, you know, it's what you like, eh? I, I once did 14 shows at a sportsman show, and I did that balloon thing. Hit them all every time. And on the last shot, in the last show, it was like I choked. I don't know. I missed the last balloon. And I was really glum. I was really down. Uh, John Beath, one of the shooters who shot with us uh, down in Pismo Beach, he was there. He had a fishing booth there. And he said, he's come to every one of these shows, and he said, Dennis, you know how hard that is? <laughs> but I didn't care. I was, I was mad at me. Yeah. But once in a blue moon, that'll happen. One time I was twirling guns at the p and &E on cement, and I did about a dozen shows, never dropped the gun. The last show was in a church uh, the day after the p and &E, on a wooden stage. I dropped my gun, <laughs> and the hammer stuck in the grain of the wood with the handle sticking up and the barrel sticking up. Oh, wow. I wished I had it on film. You couldn't, you, you know, that was so unreal. You said your wife is uh, shooting with you. Has she been shooting with you ever since you you guys met? 1964, she started. She worked at the telephone company, and I got to say that if it weren't for her, who knows if I'd still be doing this. Even today, she's mailing out the brochures for the Canadian shoot, and I am doing the, uh, starting tomorrow, doing the uh, the invites wow. for the celebs and that. So it's like... I couldn't do it without her. When we were working at the telephone company, and now that we're retired, we're both wondering, we're having trouble keeping up with it now. How did we keep up with it back then? Obviously, we didn't. Yeah, and it's great to have your wife share the sport with you because, you know, for me personally, I I don't know where I would be if Jennifer didn't wasn't shooting at the same time. Well, where I remember you, best from was, I think it was uh, Frank Lawton and Judy's shoot in uh, Deadwood, that you gave, uh, you put on a great show with Greg Danielson. You gave him a real good run for the finals. Oh, thank you. And it, that whole year was really uh, special to me because I not only got to meet him in Deadwood in the finals, also in Durango in the finals, and, you know, for the years prior he uh he was a mentor towards me so it was a, it was a really those two um will always be uh special contests because i got to meet my mentor in the uh the finals it was it was really really special well one one special shoot to me was uh back in the live ammo days was uh and and i told john wilson had asked about this my best trophy is a small little cup, the only first place cup, and they put it out at Coast Marksman. That president and his entourage decided to hold a fast draw contest. Now, you couldn't draw from the holster, and you had to point the gun down at the ground, at, you know, like at a 40 degree, 45 degree angle kind of thing, but they had paper targets, ordinary pistol targets at 20 yards, and they had the same thing at 50 yards. And you each fired 10 shots. And only three Thunderbirds showed up. Me, Bill McCadovich, and one other guy. I don't know if it was Wayne or who it was. Anyway, at the end of the 20 yard, there was Army guys, there were police guys, there was a Border Patrol guy. And that Border Patrol guy was the hardest to beat. But... The president then, he wanted to show that the fast draw guys basically were nothing. And uh, so he dreamed this event up. And what happened was, at the end of the 20 yards, I was in first, Bill was in second, and the Border Patrol guy was somewhere in the top five. Then they moved out to 50 yards, <laughs> and the Border Patrol guy, as I recall... He hit one, and I hit one, but mine was closer to the mark. So that kept me in first place, 
but it dropped Bill back to third, and the rest were just the rest. But I walked off with that cup like that'll teach you guys to try and put us down, you know. <laughs> so that that was, to me, that was the highlight for me. I got lucky, and I stayed lucky. Well, Mr. Robinson, thank you so much for coming on um, Behind the Light Gunfighter Profiles. Um, for me personally, I have nothing but respect for you you're one of the nicest guys in the sport of fast draw and you represent fast draw um very very well so i really appreciate everything you've done wow thanks glenn yeah we miss you we miss you guys in the sport so we're looking forward to seeing you back in doing your thing i hope to see you soon okay bye for now thanks Thanks again, Mr. Robinson, for coming on Behind the Light Gunfighter Profiles. And be sure to check out ThunderbirdFastDraw.com and check out that brochure for 2000, the 2013 Canadian Fast Draw Championships. It's really cool. Be sure to check out their website for even more videos from past contests and pictures. And thank you for listening.